actually, I'm not referring to this conference when I ask you the question, why are you here? What I mean is, why are all of us here, here on this planet? What is the reason for our existence? This may appear as too grandiose a question for a conference that's focused on talent management. However, I want to encourage you to think again. Isn't it true that all of us, at least at some point in our lives, ask the question, why are we here? Don't we all search for meaning? I believe that all of us want to feel inside of our hearts that there is a reason, a purpose, for us being here. Some of us find meaning in this age-old institution called family. This is true of all cultures, be they Asian, European, or American. Others find meaning in the communities we live in, in the clubs, tribes, or societies we belong to. So you might be asking and thinking, why am I telling you this in the opening presentation of this great conference? Simple. My purpose is to help others create caring, functional communities that help each other get better over time. Environments that help support each other's careers, life aspirations, and goals. That's what I feel passionately about. My journey on this quest began 16 years ago when I started my company, The Best Practice Institute. Today, we have over 42,000 subscribers from around the globe of individuals just like you who are transforming their organizations through best and next methods of organization change. One of our flagship offerings is our senior executive board comprised of chief talent officers and chief learning officers from Fortune 500 and Global 500 organizations who are making their journeys from multinational to global organizations just like yours. Over the years, we've achieved remarkable things that I'm really excited to tell you about here today. Here we are at the New York Stock Exchange. We bring together peers who are part of various organizations who create strategic alliances that have done things like reduce major pandemics across the globe and introduce new innovative technologies into emerging markets. Here we are at the Pentagon. We're helping with the major issue right now at the Pentagon with transitioning veterans to the civilian sector. If you just imagine this for a moment, Colonel Gary Kaiser is the gentleman whom I work with at the Pentagon. He's making a transition now to the civilian sector. He is an extraordinary individual. He has been through the course of action in Afghanistan and throughout over 50 tours of duty. He has been through many traumatic injuries, and now he's going back into the civilian sector. This is happening with veterans worldwide. Suicide rates are at their highest ever. So it is, our, it is our time now to bring in veterans and people who have had those traumatic injuries in the Pentagon around the world and help them to make this transition in the first 90 days that count. Currently, we're also helping the United Nations in their global compact to build a more sustainable global economy while increasing growth in emerging markets. Fundamentally, the aim of the global compact is to increase the quality of life through technology, advanced forms of medicine, and other innovations. And all these projects are about so much more than the bottom line. They're about humans. My work is where I find meaning. I believe we all need a purpose. We as humans are different from the amoeba. We're different than a collection of cells, more than an organism that just needs to eat, sleep, and eventually withers away. You ask, what does all this have to do with the world of work and HR? That's what I'm going to tell you about in this keynote address. I strongly believe that we are on the verge of a new era. The way we work, the way we live our adult lives is changing dramatically. 
the scheme we've gotten used to of getting an education, then a job, then working for the next 40 years from nine to five every day and eventually retire, sadly at which time we've started to enjoy life, are over. This is, this is a cycle that will soon be a thing of the past. I believe that our kids will look at us in disbelief when we tell them that there was a time when we worked in rigid hierarchies, taking commands from superiors, obeyed over time, got miserable, then jumped ship, only to do it over again someplace else. The days where employees put up with this are numbered. Already today, hiring managers find themselves in situations where the much coveted candidate shows up for the job interview only to ask about the policy on sabbaticals. Can you, can you believe this? Before the contract is even signed, I knew some hiring managers who would be aghast at just thinking of this. But let me tell you, they better get used to it. Take Unilever as an example. And by the way, Unilever is one of the companies participating in the UN Global Compact Initiative I just mentioned. Unilever introduced something they call Agile Working. This program lets employees work whenever and wherever they'd like, as long as the work gets done. So it's about shifting the focus from attendance to goals, from showing your face in the office to doing meaningful work in more balanced ways. Bina Plumer is the model Agile worker at Unilever, working in London. And she says, there's no real typical day for me. We're not focusing on working 9 to 5. I sometimes work at 7 in the morning. I sometimes work until 11 at night. And I'll go for a run at lunchtime, or I'll have the evening off. Sometimes I'll work really long hours, and sometimes I won't. She has all of this has improved her total quality of life. To make agile working a reality, Unilever has concentrated on two more areas besides work practices, workplaces and technology. For instance, there are no longer workspaces assigned to particular individuals. Instead, there are focus zones where you can pick a workstation or connect zones where virtual and physical meetings and technology supports everything. Broadband access is key, Google Docs, cloud sharing technologies, Skype, WeChat supports it all. This is fairly technologically advanced stuff, don't you think, in other organizations? And, and, another example. Is anyone here familiar with the all hands-on meeting? Some of us might, yes. Some of us might think of it as the toll sense system transformation meetings or large-scale change meetings we hear of uh, in the organization development market. So employees showcase their talents, all employees attend, and there's clear and open, transparent communication. And so this is a picture of a Zappos hands, all hands-on meeting. And uh, as you can see, people are very excited about their, their space, and they, uh, they show and experience transparency in a, in a very excited way. So this, this now just happens in small startup, startups, but also in large tech firms. In such a corporate culture, the CEO is expected to be personally in touch. And as The Economist recently wrote, to be grilled about everything from corporate strategy to the quality of office coffee. Now, while it's true that this process of changing the way we work is at different stages in different countries, it surely is not a Western thing anymore. Maybe it has to do more with industries than countries. Let's not let it, though. While there are industries like, say, railroads or mining that may not have purpose at the top of their agendas, just take a look at what's happening in the IT sector globally. Nowadays, software goes into all kinds of products, from the fridge in your kitchen to the cars and to your PlayStations for your kids. So the war for talent over software engineers is in full swing. In Asia and Europe and America is everywhere. Large internet firms like Flipkart, Snapdeal, in India or China's Baidu are struggling to find talent to write the ever more important code, the DNA of today's economies. The result is that in the tech sector, things are a bit like the early 90s. There are precations. You can see what they're looking like here. 
they're paid vacations before taking up a new position. And there's bidding battles over candidates, stock options, and large salaries. But today, this isn't enough. At least in Europe and the United States, people born after, say, 1980, just to pick a date, as a general rule, have grown up differently than their parents, meaning basic needs like food or shelter is something they take for granted. For many of them, building a home or buying a nice car is not what gives them purpose. Many of today's greatest talents are, in fact, looking to find a way to make a dent in the universe, like Steve Jobs used to say. So what I suggest to you today is this. This is the mindset that determines the future of HR and talent management. This is the mindset that makes you attractive as an employer. This is the mindset that lets you win the, what we call the war for engagement and the war for talent. Today, more and more, the finest talents start not by asking how much or what, they start by asking, what's my purpose? After ruminating on what's my purpose, I had an epiphany. I found there's three core elements to a powerful purpose in an organization that produces results. Purpose, process, and practice. Here it is. All of you know the practice of the product in your company. Say, for example, a, a drill company. The practice is they make drills. The process is they use the most incredible total quality management process to make the greatest drills on earth. But the purpose, is it to drill holes in the wall? No, it, it's to hang pictures of your loved ones on the wall. That's what connects to you. That's where the heart and the center, the emotion comes in loved ones of our on the wall. So this is, this is the context, the construct I want to give you today that you can bring with you wherever you go and ha however you describe your talent programs. And I'm going to bring you two cases that will show this construct and how we create case studies at BPI as well. And how you show success in your programs, how you develop success to show to your CEOs to show within your organizations. It's not enough to just come out and say, I'm doing this small project, or I'm doing a million projects at one, and I have a million challenges at one. Rather, when we take the circle of purpose and we lay it out, practice, process, purpose, we end up saying, this is why I'm here, this is what I'm doing, and this is how I'm doing it, and this is what happened as a result of what I've done. It's a shift in the way we consciously do business and work with our CEOs, connecting to that brand and purpose. It's important for employer brand as well, connecting internal and external employ employer brands. In Malaysia, you go to Ogawa not just because they make the best looking massage chairs, but as you can see here, but because it's the spring of wellness and it makes you feel younger these people in their older years doing the twist. You can see that brand of feeling younger, of connecting to that, that release of emotion that they are younger. It's not the 225 degree flip design or their calf massage and, and uh, knee massage that does it. It's the secondary purpose that sells. In Hong Kong and Singapore, when we think about quality, comfortable mattresses and cozy pillows at an affordable price, we think of Seahorse as a household name. It's not necessarily, though, the cozy pillows and comfortable mattresses that sell. It's their promise of elegance, high quality, and affordable prices that wins the game. And we think about this in Singapore, too. Think of the hotel raffles, the elegance of raffles, the understated eloquence, the beauty of the environment, whom has been at this wonderful, incredible establishment. We connect with that. We want to be there. We're attracted to that. <laughs> Who wants to go there now? <laughs> and it's no different with employer brands and your talent programs. 
Therefore, let us now look at purpose, process, and practice in the context of your talent programs. First, the purpose. Employers must start by asking why are we doing what we are doing? It's a simple metaphysical question when we get to the why. Why are we doing what we're doing? It gets to the common denominator, the simplicity of what we're doing. They must infuse a sense of meaning into what they do as an organization. I like to think of this as a revolution, perhaps as significant as the IT revolution. Much like technology a few decades ago, purpose has become a business imperative. In today's world, running an organizational intention without purpose is self-defeating for stakeholders. It's like running an organization in the 90s insisting that you don't need computers. When you begin by asking, why are we here? It turns out that the main point is humans are social animals and at the end of the day, their purpose is community. There are different catchy phrases for this to describe the idea. Purpose economy or caring means sharing and marketing guru Seth Godin calls it the connection revolution. Today it's all about humans connecting with each other. They interact through generosity and their ability to connect like we began to do in our peer networking break. Who wants to make purpose happen in this room now? Raise your hand. Are we at one person? Two people? All right, some people don't want to. Anybody else wants to make purpose? Vote by yelling. All right, we can do better than that today. It's the beginning of this conference. Give, me, give us more. Look, from the gut, do we all want to make purpose? Yes. All right, no, I heard that. <laughs> okay, it's a great, great crowd. All right, good. Okay, I want to see who can follow directions. How's that sound? <laughs> I think we can. Everybody make a, a fist with your, with your hand now, just like, like this. And just turn to the person next to you. Yeah, we all know this. <laughs> Bump their fist. <laughs> you knew it. So good. <laughs> you guys know how to do it. You just did a fist bump. Do you feel it? The ability to, to connect is, is where the art lies. It's what makes your brand remarkable. It makes it stand out. So as an employer brand, this is what will make you stand out from the crowd. And to achieve this, you need an enabling culture. And you need tools that show you how to do it. Let's turn to the process, how you enable this culture. The process. This is how you connect and enable your culture. So the question, how do you connect in today's fast-paced, fragmented, and flexible organizations? The future of work is much different than you may think. At BPI, we share purpose in a safe and caring community. We do this first by creating agreement on our non-attribution and non-disclosure rules. It makes us feel safer when we're in rooms to know that it won't leave the room. In Vegas, we say this in terms of if it happens in Vegas, it stays in Vegas. Does anyone here disagree with this statement? I will not share, distribute, or attribute any information shared within this room without prior written or verbal consent of the person speaking. So that we vote by not showing our hands. So is, does anyone here disagree with this statement? Great. We're now in a purposeful community where we can trust and share and learn from each other throughout the next two days. We can feel comfortable and safe that we can ch make strategic alliances and develop something that is larger than ourselves, just like we did at the Pentagon, just like we've done at the United Nations, just like you can do between and among organizations to find talent from and with each other, to help each other develop and grow your strategies, to make real change, be able to ask each other questions even after this conference, to be able to grow, learn, and develop with each other. That is what makes a great community. Congratulations, you're now part of the inner circle of purpose. This is it, you just agreed. The second process we use is feed forward. Advice 
rather than feed back. Instead of feed back, try feed forward. It's different. We think of advice feeding forward, people begin to listen, but feed back. Who wants to hear how lousy they did? How horrible they are? What a jerk they are. I don't want that. Even if you think it, because I'm not going to change. When I change, I connect with you, and you tell me how I can get better. Then I'm going to want to get better. So next time you have that employee in, a, in the boardroom who screams because he was really angry at what just happened, and the CEO has told him that he should never have gave that strategy or that vision or that action learning initiative, and he says, I am just leaving this room. You say, you're a real jerk for saying that. Don't you ever do that again. I don't want you ever coming back in this meeting or even working with the CEO. It's obvious you don't want to be a part of this organization. What's going to happen? He's going to step back and say, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be in this community. Instead, say, take a deep breath. Think about what you said and then decide what you want to say. Feels better, doesn't it? Some research on it. There's neuroscience behind it. It's called the stress brain loop. In the stress brain loop, we see that cortisol is released from the brain when you give feedback or say something negative to another individual. That causes a flight or fight response. Decreased regulation of cortisol decreases attention, perception, short-term memory, learning, and word finding. It's hard to find the words. Do you ever think or remember back to a time when you had a fight with somebody and you said, I should have said that? That's what, decreased, that's what happens when you increase your cortisol in your brain. It doesn't enable you to open up your mind in words to say the things that you know need to be said to clear the air. And we call that clearing and withholding. It's one of our, our rules also at BPI. We agree to clear all information in the room that we believe that happened and not withhold it from that individual. When you clear and do not withhold, what you end up doing is creating an open and transparent environment so it doesn't create energy that can be brought across the organization. This is about talking behind people's backs, essentially, which is a killer in organizations. It's one of the most dysfunctional things that can happen in an organization or in family systems theory. David Cantor spoke about it in his book about family systems theory. It was married with organization change in Deborah, Deborah Sabodnik's book on team killers. You can look it up. It's phenomenal work. And it talks about system change. System change is a phenomenal way of thinking of this. French philosophers, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He wrote a book called The Social Contract. Anyone know Social Contract? It helped establish collaborative relationships during the French Revolution. Social contracts are formed between individuals to follow up and help each other get better throughout the year. The key is follow up and making agreements about how you help each other through a social contract. This is what a social contract looks like at BPI. Feel free to use it. Practice. What will I do to help you achieve your quarterly and yearly challenges? We do things on a three, six, nine, 12 month process for a reason I'll share with you in just a moment. Time, when will I follow up with you? An agreement to follow up. Get your Google calendar out now. Get your calendar out now, whatever it may be. Let's look at a time. What can we agree on? Let's do it. We will agree to meet and talk at this time to follow up on this specific item. Expectations, what is expected of me? Are you asking me to give you advice on a particular area that you need 
to focus on, your competency that you need to improve upon, or do you want me to help you get a strategic relationship or enable you to have a meeting with the CEO or enable you to get a specific strategic alliance from outside the organizations? According to our friend and mentor, my, uh, my, uh, Marshall Goldsmith, on thousands of corporations globally, Following up on a three, six, nine, and 12 month process shows the greatest amount of positive measurable behavioral change. This is follow up with, this is a slide with no follow up. So if you look at the graph here, you'll see that it, most people said that there was no perceived change in the middle when there was no follow up. And then look at the, look at the green bars to the left. People actually got worse when you didn't follow up. So not following up has negative implications for individuals. Following up enables consistent change. This is consistent follow up. Plus three, most amount of change, 12 month consistent follow up. This has been done at companies uh, around the globe and done by by people like Maya Hu Chan, who you'll be hearing from tomorrow for many, many years. Research has shown, this has been thrown, shown through thousands of organizations, through all vertical industries around the globe, and it's cross-cultural. It's in every geography. We've done extensive research on this with Will Lenson um, and Howard Morgan and Marshall Goldsmith. It's a, it's a movement that have, has become it's extensive throughout the past 15, 20 years, and I encourage you to check it out and uh, really to, to look at this. Um, an article in particular, Leadership is a Contact Sport, which is really a phenomenal article on this particular research study. We use a tool for this that shows and uses advice and appreciation and mini review. We all know that there is a significant debate right now on performance management. To performance management or do performance appraisal or not to do performance appraisal. Who here is dealing with this debate right now? Yeah, Liberty Mutual. Ma'am, where are you from? Ricola. Yeah, OK. So two organizations are dealing with this debate. So this brings together many reviews. Just a few skills. And the appreciation, which gives the, the release of oxytocin in the brain, which makes you feel good, and enables you to have less cortisol. So ad appreciation, review, advice. That's what this tool does. And it's used at Becton Dickinson to show real change. It shows the ROI. You can check it out, SkillRider. This is why the purpose of why I'm showing this to you today is because I'm giving you all free memberships to Best Practice Institute and to utilize SkillRider here today. So use it, connect it, follow up, develop with it. It's yours to keep. You can, you can do it, sir. <laughs> you can actually use it. So uh, it's, and it's easy to set up. We can put skills on it. We have skills on it. This, you'll have your own group for here in Singapore. Great stuff. All right, this is the cross section of the human brain with purpose, process, and practice. It's kind of fun and kind of gross at the same time. Put your head in, down the middle. You'll have two parts. <laughs> you have an amygdala, which is an almond-sized shape organ in your brain, and the prefrontal or neocortex. This neocortex in the front of your brain makes rational decisions. This amygdala in your brain talks about the emotions. If that amygdala gets stimulated, the prefrontal cortex doesn't want to do anything. It gets mad at you. So <laughs> purpose is the emotion. It's what is the brand, feeling younger, children, fun, etc. Process is what makes it happen. Practice is what the actual product is. Prefrontal cortex makes the product, amygdala creates the purpose, relates to your talent programs. Let's get to some case examples. What do you do to better predict actions and behaviors of others? The practice is all about social interaction and happiness. 
So let's take two case examples. Let's look at Kimberly Clark and Beckton Dickinson. First, Kimberly Clark. The purpose at Kimberly Clark is to provide the essentials for a better life by providing the little things that make lives better. Its purpose for employees is to unleash their power and achieve the fullest potential for its culturally diverse workforce, both women and male leaders. Women and male leaders, that's what we say. Now, they have a culture of accountability to unleash their power. This is what it looks like. It's around diversity, workforce, building trust, making decisions. Think the customer, continuously improve, build talent. This pur purpose has been pervasive throughout Kimberly Clark. And they may, in order to meet the unique needs of the market in China, they had, to in, they had to connect that internal brand with their external brand. And, and the external brand was being portrayed differently than the internal brand in the market. Women in China had a statement that they brought out in focus groups. A successful woman is not necessarily a happy woman. Women, <laughs> so, women were staying at work 14 hour days. They couldn't get to their homes at night. They were talking to their children on WeChat and Skype. This kind of, just, it had to change. And it, think of the incredible amount of, of discourse that happens in a person's life when you keep them from their children. Instead, the grandparents would be taking care of, of women and of their women's children in single family households. Wasn't right. And, and Naomi Montanero, who will be speaking in Hong Kong, knew something needed to happen. This external brand where mothers were helped didn't work within the internal brand. So Naomi said, the good thing about working at Kimberly Clark is that something that is discovered as a requirement for change can be acted upon with speed and agility. By the way, she really said, when it happens on Monday, it can change on a Tuesday. So that's pretty fast. That's agile change. So she did that. Here's what she did. She instituted flexible working hours for women. She made it quickly and swiftly. She increased morale, engagement, and alleviated stress in women employees in China. And it happened in two days. Now, if this kind of small transactional change can happen with one person, what can you do to go against the grain in your organization tomorrow? Or maybe after this break. Maybe after later. Beck and Dickinson. Beck and Dickinson's purpose is helping people live all healthy, helping people live healthy lives by producing life-saving diagnostic and other medical devices to cure cancer and other major life-threatening diseases. The purpose of the talent program at Beck and Dickinson was fourfold. Uh, to improve the talent pipeline, reduce top talent turnover, increase mobility, and connect leaders to purpose. It was called the Early Career Experience Program at Beck and Dickinson. They chose some highly experienced top leaders to become part of a cross-functional, very exclusive program across the globe. And they brought them through amazing experiences throughout Europe, Asia, and the Americas. And half of it was outside of America, which emulated its shareholder value, emulated, emulated their, their books. It's the way they purposefully looked at how this organization works and the leaders they know they need in the pipeline and how it connects to the revenue and sales of the company. If they chose different people at different parts of the organization, they wouldn't connect to the ROI. And the CEO wouldn't even approve any of this. So every single one of their programs is connected to geographies and specificity to market and market segmentation and their pr products themselves. So this was, their, this was their process. They accelerated the development and networking of early high career potentials. So Beckton Dickinson 
is a place where networking comes first. In order to be, work within your cohorts, they brought it back home and to work with people and stakeholders. So they felt by working inside their networks, they can go back home and get better over time. That's exactly what they did. When they went back home, they began to ask questions around from their stakeholders as to how did I improve and how can I get better. So they used tools to do that. It was on, it was on a uh, four-point scale, and the scale itself was dramatically advanced. You had, to use, you had to use extremities. So did horribly bad or did incredibly better. So it, you read a new Harvard Business Review article on this. Extremities in assessment and reviews are, in fact, w one of the best ways to understand leadership derailers. And uh, here are the br bright, fresh, fine, shiny faces of all of the great people in the Beck and Dickinson uh, ECE. So the process of the program, again, was to train them, retain them, and see them increase their mobility up and sideways. And they were becoming succession candidates at the top level of the organization. They, they borrowed from the GE model. Do we all know the GE model of giving three functions, three divisions, and three regions experience in those three areas? That's cross-functional rotations, one of our top critical success factors, and we all know that. So the key element, again, practicing the real work of the organization. That was a key and critical component of this work. They had two different specific experiential activities that brought them closer to this purpose of the real work of the organization. First was a social responsibility project. It connected their leaders to the company purpose because all leaders visited Tanzania to implement and deploy prenatal testing in rural areas. And they managed and led the procurement and purchase of mobile ultrasound devices. They use vehicles and to transport patients. And it's estimated that the project will save 20 lives per year. Can, can you imagine giving your leaders that ability to know that they can save 20 lives per year rather than put, making a device or putting a, a piece on an aluminum can or, or even crunching numbers one day, you instead go and you help save 20 people's lives. It's a great thing. Sounds like I want to go work there. Save some lives. You can also tell a lot of people about it. Employer brand works everywhere. Works everywhere. They had a business improvement project, too. It was a critical part of the program. One cohort identified and employed a program that would alleviate what is what's called, it's called the single source supplier risk. Is anyone familiar with that from manufacturing companies and industrial, industrial companies? Basically, if you, if you don't have a certain part, you can't bring it to market, and there's only one supplier, you're done. So, it, it, so what they did was the ECE program participants went and found that for one of their biggest cancer diagnostic projects in, in, in Asia. I'm not allowed to disclose the exact place, but you'll figure it out when I say when I give you the, the punchline. They found the single source supplier risk. They developed a joint venture partnership. The week later, a week later after they did this, the tsunami and earthquakes hit in Japan. So they felt good about the fact that they saved millions of lives. Purpose sells. Of course, for most organizations, all of this amounts to nothing less than a culture change. And it won't be easy. Among other things, it will require a new type of leader. And that, in turn, requires a new and strengthened role for people like you. This battle will not be won overnight. That's what I want to leave you with, a call to not lose heart. If multinationals like Unilever, BD, and Kimberly Clark can get it, other companies will get it too. More and more CEOs and senior executives begin to see that to attract, retain, and motivate top talent, we can no longer run our companies like we did in the industrial age. I like to think of HR as playing the part of first violin in an orchestra. <laughs> There's a gun. <laughs> 
You already did your parent networking break. To play, does anybody know what the first violin does? The conductor determines what to play, but the first violin sets the tone. It's a broker, a facilitator of sorts, between conductor and musicians. Some even consider it the guiding lighthouse of the orchestra. To reach the golden chores of purpose in the future. An entire journey lies ahead of us. The road to travel may appear confusing to you, full of blocks, forks, and turns. But think about it. It's only human. It's natural. It's good. Just as successful brands strive to really understand their customers and why they come and buy their product, management must understand the motivations, the frustrations, the values, hopes, and dreams of their employees. We all go to work every day. As adults, we spend the better part of our waking lives at work. How much better would life be if this day-to-day -day would carry more meaning than just survival? We now live in a different era. Employees and customers today are looking for sustainable solutions. I want you all to remember, your job is a great one. Your contributions and the way to instill purpose in your organizations are phenomenal. You play the first violin. Go and set the tone. Thank you. Who's got the first question? Come on, let's, all right. Uh, just a reminder, you can text in your questions to 73333 with the message TMA, space your question. Too much advice? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Maya. Uh, Thanks. Um, so you, you talked about the BD example, yes. right? the ECE project. Um, I'm curious at how do they measure the ROIs of those initiatives or projects like that? Thanks for that question, Maya. Um, BD is really interesting. They're, they're one of the few organizations that have, has gotten ROI right. Kirkpatrick's Ford just doesn't get us there. And Jack Phillips talks about it with ROI, and we give a nice algorithm, and we can go to results and transfer and behavior. And, but we never get to ROI, do we? Does anyone, I don't, does anyone get, got to ROI here? It's cool if you did. I want to know you if you did. Um, so what they did is they looked at a pre, during, and post. And they c tied it to their actual revenues and to transfer of learning and a series of very strict standards. That rating scale I was talking about before. So you could see the change that occurred before and after the program. And you have an actual measurement. They had, a, out of a five, a 4.7 that changed from pre to post in terms of leadership behavior and tied to business results. So tying to talent mobility, later, lateral moves inside the organization and succession planning, as well as the product, product itself that they increased, those business improvement projects, part of the ROI. They can actually show that we saved money, lives, times, patient, patients, Real ROI, real behavior change, real transfer of learning. Phenomenal stuff they did. Maya, thank you so much. I know, it, thank you. I was looking here, but I, it was for you. <laughs> I want to make sure I'm. Any other questions? I, and I'll, yeah. I'm here for you. Anybody, anybody else? You're saving them all for the coffee. Do everyone want coffee? <laughs> Feeling good about coffee? Well, look, thank you so much for your time. I, I, I appreciate it. And it's so good to be here. I'll be here later on as well this afternoon for a moderated discussion. So I look forward to seeing you all. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.